In 2021, I used my design thinking and skills in investing, which outperformed SPY beautifully. But as we can see in the July 2022 video, things didn't pan out that well. As we're kicking off 2023, it's time to recap the whole 2022 and see what went well, what went wrong, what I learned, and what insights you can take away to help you grow your account. In this video, I'll go over five things. First, I'll start with portfolio update, spoiler alert, it was not great. So we can see what happened today and what I've learned and what you can avoid. Then followed by some great news, I will tell you three best moves that I've made in 2022. When our emotion returns to the normal level, I will go over three worst things that happened to this portfolio last year. After that, I will dissect those mistakes, turn those into learnings, and package them into the next iteration for future execution. Last but not least, to go over what I'm going to do for my portfolio in 2023. What I'm buying, trimming, why am I doing that? Spoiler alert, I'm adding six new holdings. And as you know my style, you don't have to smash the like button just yet. Do that in the very end if you find this video useful or insightful. Hope you're kind of cool. Now get your favorite drink and let's get into it. Good morning everyone, my name is Justine. I'm a designer working in Silicon Valley. Let's jump right to chapter one, portfolio recap. 2022. I'm going to break this down into two calculations. The first one is the total return of full year of 2022. That number looks terrible, huh? The S&P, Nasdaq, and Dow Jones during those periods are down 20%, 33%, and 9%. So obviously, I underperformed. Very underperformed. Second is the period from July 2020 to the end of 2022, which marks the total performance since I adopted the investing mindset, returns a negative 318%. It looks way worse. Of course, I failed to beat the market. What can possibly go wrong and so wrong that I'm down 90% and negative 300%? What the hell happened? Well, the main contributing factor is, of course, the put credit spreads that I opened with margin now. Yes, you heard it right. Put credit spreads. Option trading. Watch out for that dangerous animal. I really fell into a period of complete idiocy in 2022, fueled by some misleading TD Ameritrade number tricks. Tragedy can happen. I've documented all the details and learnings in that video. I highly recommend you check it out to know what to avoid. More on that topic in chapter 4 in this video. If we discount the loss from the put credit spreads, those numbers will look like this. Negative 62% and negative 105. Still bad, but not that bad. I think it's important to take a moment and sort out all the emotions when things like this happen so we can move forward. So how do you feel? I actually feel okay, really. If anything, I feel a little bit stupid, lingering stupidity. I mean, this is ridiculous. Hilariously ridiculous. It's some learning for sure and a proper reset. With my maximum 70% saving rate working in tech, I think I can recover. To lighten up the mood a little bit, now let's look at the best three things that I did in 2022. The first thing is that I've been buying JP, the JP Morgan Premium Income Fund for its dividends. I went through why I'm buying it in these two videos. I'll leave the links in the description. It currently pays an over 10% dividend. Crazy. Compared to most of the dividend paying stock from 1 to 3%. It also pays monthly rather than quarterly, so it can compound faster with dividend reinvestment plan. You can see the dividend distribution monthly in my Robinhood account starting from June 2022 to January 2023. The overall performance of JAPI is not bad either. It's holding fairly okay in this downtrend macro environment. As of January 10th, my JAPI holding is only down 2%. Versus SPY is down. 4%. The second best thing I did was all the covered call option contracts I sold against my own Tesla stocks. This is a little crazy, you can keep scrolling and scrolling the transaction record, almost 500 trades on selling call options. Compared to 2021, I think I spent less time on it, but still, it's taking some time and effort. All in all, I netted over 6k profit on this, which helped lift the portfolio a little bit, a nice to have. The third best thing is that I rediscovered Robin Hood. Specifically, I realized that it's a unique combination of daily recurring purchase, fractional shares, dividend reinvestment plan, and a very user-friendly design and interface, which is important to me as a designer. With that combination, I can dollar cost average in, stay invested without looking at it. It's fantastic. Automation is fantastic. I just can't find another brokerage with that combination. If you do, let me know in the comment section down below. Therefore, I have been reusing Robinhood since then. And again, it's fantastic. 
Just FYI, I'm not sponsored by Robinhood. It just come from my pure, honest opinion. So those are the three best things. And now let's take a look at the three worst things. The worst of the worst is the amount of put credit spreads I opened with margin loans that end up losing 84K. Not just on paper, it literally disappeared from my account. If you're thinking of trading option spreads because other YouTubers said you can make quick money and you do not understand its implications, I will highly recommend you to watch my user-friendly one-on-one videos on spreads and then see how things can possibly go wrong in another video. I can't give financial advice. This video is strictly informational only and I'm sharing what I know. Hmm, if you tell people what not to buy and what not to do, is this still financial advice? Hmm, anyways, the gist is that if your put credit spreads go south, you lose everything. That's the inherent risk that is not emphasized enough on YouTube. For example, look at this 121-120 Tesla put credit spread on Robinhood. The maximum loss is $45. You can lose all $45 if this goes south and not according to plan. And there's no way to recover. And if you borrow money and get a loan for put credit spreads, many of them, and they all go south, that's how you can lose a lot of money really quickly. And that inherent risk is different from stocks. If you spend all $45 on Tesla fractional shares on Robinhood, the only way to lose all $45 is Tesla, the company, goes bankrupt. The probability of that is a lot, lot, lot lower. If Tesla stock goes down, but you don't sell those shares, it's still possible for it to recover over time. Now moving on to the next worst thing was Square, a block. I still like their products, I like their ecosystem, but as you know, macro sell-off really made everybody scrutinize the company fundamentals and valuations. Their fundamentals are not super great, the PE is very high. As a result, it sold off very quickly and it was down about 50% in 2022. I had both Tesla and Square. They were both high PE stocks back then. As a designer, I like to simplify and consolidate. So I was thinking, hmm, which one has lower PE? Which one has faster growth, higher growth? Which one I have more conviction on? Ah, oh, Tesla. Therefore, I clear out my square position at around 100 bucks when it's on its way down and took a loss about 11K. The last thing is BlockFi's bankruptcy. All my Bitcoins and Ethereums are gone, at least for now. I hope they can turn around from that chapter 11 and give my money back, but no guarantee. That netted about 1K loss in crypto. I wish I knew better. The slight better side is I stopped buying crypto since July last year. And I also know cryptos are very risky and underregulated, so anything I put in was plain money. I assume it's already gone, and I'm okay that 1k being gone. I had a thousand dollar worth of fun in crypto for two years. If I phrase it like that, not too bad. And that sums up the three worst things that happened to my portfolio in 2022. Now it's the exciting part. What I have learned in 2022. Learning means another round of iteration on the design of my portfolio. It will get better and more indestructible over time. So if you're thinking doing something that I already did, like using margin loans, put credit spreads, etc., or you want to test or experiment, maybe this will save you some time by seeing how it played out on my end. Now, let's go over my top five pieces of learning in 2022. The way I structure this is on the left is all the learnings, on the right side is the backstories, the evidence that helped me reach that conclusion. So the first is calculate the worst scenario before opening a position and know what you're gonna do if that worst scenario happens. If you don't have a plan, do not open that position. So essentially, knowing what you're buying, knowing the inherent risk, calculate the risk and have a plan for it if that actually happens. Because likely it could happen. And of course, I realized this after I actually lose real money by not calculating the risk. So make sure you do that when you open a new position. Second, borrow no more than three months worth of investment money from your paycheck or 29% of your portfolio value whichever one is smaller, to avoid margin call. In general, I think it's okay to borrow money, it's okay to use margin, but at the same time, be careful of how much you borrow. Borrow wisely and responsibly. And of course, I learned this from the same Tesla put credit spread tragedy. Number three, don't invest in a company if its ROCE is less than 8%, because that means its return is lower than the cost of capital. ROCE means return of capital employed. Meaning if a company is spending money to reinvest into its business and it's less than 8%, do not invest, do not proceed, 
because it's a money losing business. It's destroying wealth. 8% is on average the interest you have to pay to borrow money. And if the return of a company is less than that, then it's very much a money losing business. I would not invest in that. And I learned about this from the research paper. You can read about it. I will have a link in the description down below. Top learning number four. It's okay to wait or invest less when a company's PE is too high, when a company's valuation is too high to minimize valuation risk. I learned this from one of the Joseph Carlson videos. I also have a link in the description. Essentially, you don't have to go all in in a company and be done. It's not like I'll be done investing if I own a thousand shares of Tesla. Investing is long term, it's over a long period of time. And valuation risk can happen at any point because the market fluctuates. The stock price does not reflect the fair market value. So if you put everything all at once at a very high valuation point, it's likely you will see red on paper and it's better to invest that money elsewhere. DCA does cost average is better. If the business fundamental is really good, great business, it will actually continue to grow and compound quarter over quarter, year over year. You can look at the chart of Apple, Microsoft. You will not miss it if you wait. Just like Tesla, you can wait a whole year and invest in the beginning of 2023. You get a great bargain. You get a much more attractive valuation. Last one, VOO is good enough of a buy. VOO is just like SPY, it tracks the S&P 500, it's an index fund. My biggest realization about this is that's actually something you can own for life. You don't need to spend time paying any attention to it when the market goes up and down because it auto rotates out bad business. It might take some time to rotate and be slower than the actual top 500 companies, but still, you don't need to analyze individual companies anymore and it yields very consistent good return. You can take a look at this article, Warren Buffett's bet, S&P 500 tends to outperform hedge funds long term. There are more learnings to this and I cannot cram everything in one video. So if you like a copy of this doc, feel free to leave a comment down below, then send me an email, I'm happy to share it with you. So that you can make more money and dodge the money losing bullet by looking at what I have learned. All right, after all the recap, the best, the worst, what I've learned, it's time to go over the last chapter. What's my comeback? What's my move to try to beat the market in 2023? Chapter five, my investment plan for 2023. I will try my best to beat the market, to beat SPY in 2023. But of course, there's no guarantee. So please do not copy me. I'll share my plan and brief analysis and you can see what makes sense to you. Number one, real estate. Uh, no real estate. No real estate? I just don't have that kind of money, dude. Next, crypto. No more crypto. I don't want to invest in anything speculative and underregulated assets at the moment because those two things likely will not help me achieve my goal of growing my account and beat the market. Next is art. I'm a designer. I like art. I do art. I do see value in art. Art is valuable. I was looking into master works, but I haven't done anything with it yet. I need to investigate more. Even if I invest in anything in art, it will be somewhat insignificant amount compared to stocks. Probably 5k top. Options. No more spreads anymore. Put credit, call debit, whatever spreads available. No, thank you. However, I will sell cover calls against my shares to hedge just a bit in case the Fed rate stays high this year. Last one, stocks. I have five categories. Number one, I will keep buying Tesla stocks. This is my big future bet that will beat the market, beat SPY in a longer time frame. Perhaps three, five, ten years. One year is way too short to tell. Just as a note, I think everyone should look at how little debt Tesla has from the 2022 Q3 earnings report. Another thing I learned, a company will not go bankrupt if they don't have debt. Next is Apple. It's a design company. It's a company that does design right. Impeccable intuition, excellent craft, brilliant execution. It's my hypothesis that company with good design will do well long term. Speaking from a designer's perspective, and Apple is the best example. And I think they can single-handedly beat the market, beat SPY. The third one is a new position that I'm adding, and it will be a basket of five companies that combine into one. AutoZone, Kroger, Dick Sporting Goods, Older Beauty, and Hershey. You might see some commonalities. They're all very defensive, stable companies, but with good growth. So they're positioned to weather its macro environment pretty well, especially if Papa Powell's continues to raise interest rate to 5%. I picked them solely based on their fundamentals. The free cash flow yield, 
earnings growth and ROCE, which we just talked about. Purely by numbers, they all have equal weights and all combined to be one category in my portfolio. Next is VOO. For those who don't know VOO and SPY, they're pretty much the same thing. Tracking S&P 500 is an index fund. I know it doesn't sound like me. I try to beat the market, but I'm buying VOO. But don't get me wrong, my conviction to the first three categories are still pretty strong. But I also understand conviction doesn't mean guarantee. In case I'm wrong, at least I have VOO to fall back to. Plus, remember one of the learnings that I had? The benefits of VOO are just too hard to ignore, especially the first two. Lastly, JAPI. This is exclusively for dividend income stream, not for capital appreciation like the first four. I have a video to highlight the distinction between the two, I will have it in the corner and description down below. Therefore, it's not about comparing against SPY because they aim for different things. Ultimately, it could be a non-stop ATM that pays me monthly enough to retire early. I've been buying it consistently and it has been paying me dividends every single month, passively, without me doing anything. So those are all my five holdings, five tranches, and essentially five different experiments I'm running at the same time. And I'm buying all those on Robinhood with daily recurring purchase, dollar cost averaging. So I don't need to spend time analyzing when it's best time to buy and dump it when it's too high. I don't need to worry about the fluctuations. I don't have to open the Robinhood app at all. It's fantastic. If you want me to do a deep dive in all my positions, feel free to leave a comment down below and I will get back to you. I read every comment. All right, that's all five chapters. If you learn anything new or find anything useful, please destroy the like button down below to help support this very, very small channel and I really appreciate it. And consider subscribing so you don't miss any future user-friendly finance videos. If you're inspired to find out how to buy put option contract to hedge the market, and how dividends can be a non-stop ATM. What you need is easy to understand and step-by-step -step breakdown tutorials. And that's where I came in. I have used my best craft and design to capture those in these videos for you. Check them out right there. Like and subscribe to help support this channel and keep using design to square up your finances. See you all in the next video. Cheers.